Hey there, Knicks fans. How you doing? It's your boy, John of the Macri, with you for another edition of the Knicks Film School podcast. Um, an edition that I am, again, I was saying it with, uh, or on the post game last night. I think I've, I think I forgot how to, how to talk about this team when it's not just all sunshine and rainbows, but upwards and onwards we go. And uh, as much as I wish I could be talking to this person about a 10 game winning streak, because he deserves it, because he's been such an amazing addition to the Knicks Film School team. Uh, alas, we must do God's work and talk about the Knicks in the state that they've existed in for much of the last two decades. And he's been a fan for all mm-hmm. of that time and more. So maybe that's maybe that's appropriate. Um, you know him from his threads on uh, with film, not only on the Knicks, but also uh, film on other NBA teams. He's great on everything as far as covering the league. Um, but yeah, to us, he's been doing next stuff. So, uh, DJ, I, I, yes, sir. DJ, like DJ Zulo, that is your name. And then you go by Ace Zulo on Twitter, right? I do. So just a, a quick rundown on that. So my wife is the Acevedo. I'm the Zulo and she was, um, an only child. So it, she was the last in the line of her, the Acevedos on her side of the family. So the nice husband I was, <clears throat> I was, or the nice fiance, I was like, you know, why don't we combine the names, do the hyphenating, uh, thing and I'll take yours. You take mine. It was a, um, you know, trying to be a Renaissance man, a little modern, uh, style, get on the good side of her, uh, her dad. And it's, it's, it's worked out until like, you know, we had kids and they're like, I have to do both these things in school and the filling out the name and you have this long thing, but you know, it seemed like a good idea, good idea at the time. So the Twitter so, is kind of combining the two. We have to, we have to divert before okay. we talk about the Knicks very briefly. And I think yes. I've told this story in the pod. And if I have, and you're listening and you're like, don't tell the story again, I apologize. <laughs> but my, my wife is doing my daughter's hair right in front of me as I'm recording this podcast. And I had a similar idea. Cause I also, I too consider, you know, myself a, a modern, a modern chap. So I was like, you know, my wife's last name is Kuzumano. My last name is Macri. I'm like you, by marrying me, you don't, you don't cease to exist as Dolores mm. Guzmano. You are still Dolores Guzmano. Like marrying me does not turn you into a different person. So you should just like, you should just hyphenate your last, your last, or I mean, I was like, keep your last name if you want, or, right. or but at the very least hyphenate your last name. So she, I convinced her of this. And um, so she is legally, I think as a, unless she changed it, <laughs> Dolores Guzmano hyphen Macri. And she has hated me. For really, the, for every day since I convinced her to do this, because she's like, it is such a pain in the rear end to the point that when we had our our first daughter, she's like, I'm not naming her uh, Scarlett Kuzma Macri. It's just going to be Macri because she. she I'm not. Yes. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not making her write <laughs> out. How I don't know how many letters is it? Thirteen letters. It's a what? lot. It's a lot. I have a lot. Yeah, it's yeah, too many. It's letters, a lot. So too many. Yeah. So yeah. So it's um. So I get where you're coming from, but that's that's mm-hmm. very cool. So DJ, yes, um, so yeah, we are we are talking about a Knicks team that has come off their their first loss. Before we get into some like you know a couple of nitty gritty things that mm-hmm. I want to talk to you about, because again, you're knee deep in the film uh, in a way that I wish I had time to be, but unfortunately I don't. Um, what are your like overall impressions coming off the Hornets game? Because I feel like it's a type of loss where uh, you know we we say certain types of players are like Rorschach tests for like what kind of a fan you are. I feel like that loss is like a Rorschach test for what kind of fan you are. Like some people like, you know, Oh, it's all coming down. Everything was fake. This and that. And other people are like, they were just, you know, whatever it's a loss. They, they, yeah. Um, so I, I guess I have a couple thoughts on that and it, it was watching the game and I tweeted this in the third quarter, just how, how much it seemed like the Knicks were just running in cement. And I, I listened to the post game show that you did with uh, Benji this morning, just kind of get a feel of what you guys were thinking about in that, in that game. And I think Benji had mentioned how it was the first time he had seen the Knicks just consistently being beat to the ball. And it's, it was clear as day that there was, something lingering from that Boston game. And to me, it's like, you don't have the margin for error without Brunson and we don't have that edge. Things are You can lose a game to a team that was just playing harder than you. And the frustrating part is, you know, I was kind of like looking ahead and you have the four, you have the four game West coast swing. That's the part that is a little frustrating. And although I was frustrated after the loss, I'm even more, a, a little more frustrated today, just thinking about the fact that they have four really tough games I know the Lakers won't have LeBron, but AD is playing great right now. Still tough. 
still, still tough. tough on the road. And the Clippers are going to have two days off prior to the Knicks. So that everyone's going to be healthy and playing. And you just wanted to bank that Hornets game in before you go on that swing. And I think thinking about it now, when you're considering whether or not they can get to the four seed or hold off the, the Brooklyn Nets, that part is kind of, I, I can't get that out of my mind that I just wish they had figured out a way to just pull that game out, whether it was a Tibbs adjustment here and there or a couple of made shots or a couple of defensive stops. I wish that game would have just turned out differently because they had this, this uh, West coast swing, which, you know, I think they're going to get the Portland game, but beyond that, you know, those first three, I, I, I don't know, you know, they, it, it could be a one and three trip and then you're, and then that's one and four in your last five. And, you know, you don't know where you go from there. So I think that's the part that's a little bit, frustrating for me that it was a win, obviously a winnable game. And when you're coming on the, you know, you're about to head West, it's just a game you wanted to get. The problem. I agree with everything you said, by the way. And and the one, the word you use, and I don't know why this of all things is like, sick of, you wanted to just bank it, right? You just yeah. wanted to figure out a way right. to get that one, <laughs> one more deposit in the bank to That's say it. nothing of the fact that it's a round number, right? 10, mm. uh, 10 in a row, 40 wins on the season, right? Both, both mm-hmm. nice round numbers. Um, but like the thing about when you change the goalposts or when you, I, I don't know, do you move the goalposts forward? farther away? I don't, I, 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 I don't know now <laughs> they're, they're moved, but I'm not sure in which direction <laughs> they moved in a direction. <laughs> <laughs> it's some way, some or the thing about moving the goalposts is right. once you move them, you can't move them back. Like they've been moved for the season. That That is now yeah. where they are. They can only mm-hmm. continue going in that direction. Uh, you can't turn them around. So, like, maybe at a different time this year, you would have looked at this West Coast trip and, and let's say, for argument's sake, that the Knicks were sitting here right now and they were, like, fighting for to stay in seventh, right? Mm-hmm. And you're like, okay, just get through it at one and three. I want to see, you know, let's say they've been struggling. I want to see them play well, you know, whatever. You, you sign for what you sign for. Maybe if someone was injured, and, and I say this not knowing what Brunson's, if Brunson's going to play, but we hope he plays, mm-hmm. you know, whatever. It's a different conversation. Now it's like, Two and two. What do you mean two and two? The team just won nine games in a row. And I'm sitting here thinking like you. I'm like, where again? Where do I sign for two and two? I think I I would sign for that right now. Absolutely. Um, so it's a good transition because I I think the I, and again like I I'm really curious to pick your brain about this because the there are like there are narratives which are like the least useful thing. There are the numbers. Which are very useful. I don't want to mm-hmm. disparage. I'm, I'm I'm a big numbers guy. I don't want to disparage the thing that I rest a lot of my opinions on. But to me, the film is like the lifeblood of like, okay, what is this team? What could they do? What are they capable of? What do they actually do on a consistent basis? So like, you know, for you, where the Knicks are at right now, based on what we've been seeing, I guess what I'll ask is, do you think it's fair? that the goalposts were being moved again. We don't know the direction in the direction that they were being moved in, in terms of like the conversation being like, okay, this team is a threat to maybe not only win one playoff series. Maybe this team is a threat to win multiple playoff series. Like, did you see evidence of the fact that like, okay, I'm, I'm buying this. I did. Um, the only game that that felt like a little bit of an aberration was the Miami, the Miami game in the sense that the most recent one, that's the, obviously the Julius Randall heave at the end for the win. It just seemed like there was so much one-on-one isolation, tough shot making. Then that that was the game that if that was kind of the microcosm of where this team was, how this team was winning, then I would say, yeah, it's it's some smoke and mirrors and and nothing sustainable there. But to me, and we, and this is, uh, it's kind of been talked about at nauseum and how, how this team wins, you know, their offensive rebounding advantage is real. It's they, they teach it, they practice it. Um, it is a legitimate threat. As soon as Mitchell Robinson came back, it was enhanced because they don't have that drop off uh, from uh, the backup. Uh, Hartenstein is Hartenstein, yeah. um, third. Hartenstein is third in the le- in the league in offensive rebounding percentage, right behind Mitch. I mean, they don't lose anything in that. And then in terms of uh, you know the shot making and some of the things that Brunson was doing, nothing in him feels like it was sustainable. I mean, he is. Nope. This is what he was doing in Dallas and a, a lower usage. This is what he did in the playoffs for Dallas. So, I mean, there was so many things that this team was doing that felt like it was legitimate. And, you know, there was that, again, we talk about narratives. There was a narrative earlier in the season where the Knicks were getting some wins, but they weren't really against the top competition. So there was the thought that, yeah, you know, how how good is this team if they're not beating the best teams? And obviously that has been 
turn on his head because they have beaten you know Boston a couple of times. They've beaten Miami. They they've beaten so many of these upper echelon teams, the Sixers. So beat Philly. Yeah, I was about to say beat Philly. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So it, it doesn't feel like this team is is doing it in any way that doesn't feel at least in the regular season. Maybe we can talk about how this works in the postseason. But yeah, to me, nothing is is gonna is, is kind of. Um, making me waver in the idea that this team is a legitimate threat to win a first round series. And then if it's, you know, depending on who it is in the second round, you know, Milwaukee just is to me is, is a different animal. Um, but if it's Boston or whoever, I, I feel this team at least has a fighting chance. And um, yeah, I just, I, I really overall forget the the Hornets game. This team is, you know, they can have a game where it just didn't work out and they can have a game where, and I think you had mentioned it where they've been, beaten on the, uh, you know, over the head a few times this year and they've always risen back and they've always kind of taken the hit and, yep. and pushed back. There's been multiple times where we've wondered where, whether or not a loss was going to mean that they're going to have a change in the head coaching position. So twice, I no, twice, twice I wondered that after twice. game seven, seven mm-hmm. single digits. I wondered that. After and then that the Dallas game, right? And yep. then the Dallas game. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. to me, this team is in terms of like their mental fortitude, I just find this team to be, and this is a, um, yeah, they're bringing in the right guys. But to me, if you want to like talk about the the how how Tom Thibodeau really gets the best out of his players, it's it's the idea that he doesn't let he he will make sure this team is in the right frame of mind as they go west. I'm not worried about that. And I'm really not worried about this team in, in terms of like how they're playing in terms of their sustainability. I, I think there's some, I don't know, low hanging fruit that they can even improve upon. And um, so no, I I think this team, if you look at the way they beat teams um, again, other than that Miami game where I thought there was just a lot of like really tough shot making that you can't really bank on. Yeah. This seems legit. They're a legitimate, you know, upper forties, low fifties win team. I mean, there's nothing to me, whether it, it is the numbers or the the film that would suggest otherwise. There, I'm glad you, you, it just clicked for me when you brought up the Miami game a second time where yes, the Miami game, the, because, and, Im- implicit in what you're uh, I- saying is that the things that they usually do well, they did not do well in the Miami game, which is like they didn't get a ton of offensive rebounds. They turned it over. I guess actually that was the one area that, that it was fine, but like free throws, they were they were out shot at the free throw line. Mm-hmm. It was just they they made a lot of shots. The Hornets game was the exact opposite of that in in the sense that like you didn't get well, there was no Brunson. So you didn't have shot making from him. You had no shot making from Julius Randle. You got no shot making from Emmanuel quickly, who I I think is their third best, you know, quote unquote shot maker this year. I don't know. Do you share that opinion? 100% agree. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. A- and then um, on top of those three, the one not being there, two not having great games, they couldn't hit the far side of a barn, uh, you know, at least in terms of how they have been shooting recently. I want to get to the low hanging fruit in a bit, but I want to talk about two players that stood out um, for, for me for that game. First of which is Quentin Grimes. So you had a great thread on Quentin Grimes today. Mm -hmm. Um, And Grimes has kind of become in the midst of their top two and quickly and RJ, who we always talk about. And then Josh Mm -hmm. Hart, um, you know, and like, he's kind of not, I don't want to say he's become the forgotten man because he's, that's not it, but like he's he has actually almost become an afterthought in terms mm-hmm. of like how they're doing what they're doing, how important he is, why it's so important that he not only is in the starting lineup, but like I know for me personally, like I have even with everybody producing the way they've been producing, been producing, I have not thought for one second like, oh, maybe they should consider a change in the starting lineup and take. Quentin Grimes out of there because of the reason some of the reasons that you talked about. So why don't I'm I'm gonna actually give you the floor to like kind of yeah. talk about your your thread that you put out. Yeah. So basically it was one of those things where I'm just like watching him and it just seemed odd to me that his it just I I in my mind, you know how you picture a player doing a thing on the court, and I was literally just like thinking, I was playing basketball with my son, and I'm like, when's the last time I saw Quentin Grimes take a three from the top of the key and it go in? And I'm like, I don't I have no recollection of this happening and I know it's happened. I'm like, so, so I'm like, first of all, let me go to the shot chart just to validate this thought. And it was like, all right, he's shooting 14% from the top of the key from three. That's, that's bad. I mean, that's, and, and this is a, the Knicks best floor spacer or the, you know, arguably, you know, the most important floor spacer in that starting lineup. That's something that we have to look at. Then it was clear that there was this like idea that he's elite from the left corner. And I, 
pointed this out where if you're you know, depending on what hand you shoot with, if you're a right hand shooter, you're going to favor generally the left court, left side and how RJ is how he favors the right side, because I just feel like the side of the backboard can kind of play mind games on certain players. So he's great on the left side and even the left wing, but everywhere else, it's just been kind of a struggle. And, you know, I, I, I as you, as you do, I, I go to basketball reference or uh, b-ball index all the time. I'm just yeah. kind of checking on their metrics and his shot making has really dipped this year in terms of the three pointer. And, you know, I'm just, I'm, it was more of like, not a trying to speak ill of him as a player because I think he's had a really yeah, good year. And you didn't. I, uh, I, you I, were very careful not to do that. I was that. trying not to. And I knew how you know you could do these threads that could come off as you being a hater. And I really didn't want that to happen. And I really tried to like obviously talk about the fact that his defense is going to keep him on the court. And he's their by far their best uh defender against most point guards, uh, lead guards in terms of um, you know, the the really top level shot makers and he's really good against uh, most wings. He's generally guarding the top offensive player on the other team. His defense has been an absolute key for this team's winning and he's in his second year. So there's a lot of, you know, and, and I feel like with winning, you get guys that you almost put a little bit more pressure on when they might not be ready. I mean, he's, he didn't, he had a, a truncated first year. He had the injury this year. He kind of had the injury. He started late. So, I mean, there's, he hasn't played a ton of games. He's only 22. He's soon to be 23. You know, there's a lot. He's got room to grow, but this team is careening towards the playoffs. They're going to be in big games and they just need his shooting because right now, RJ shooting is, you know, he can go four for seven or he can go like last night and go, I think he went one for seven. Um, I was about to say one of seven from three. And yeah. if there was a tough contested look in those seven. I don't talk about things you don't remember. I don't remember it because I feel like all of them were the one he made was that corner three that he was he kind of he, he got a loose ball and, and sort of backed up and had a wide open uh, shot from that right corner and and made it. Um, and, you know, Randall Randall has been and the thing that kind of is maybe uh, keeping this Grimes concern of mine at bay a little bit is that they get such an advantage with Randall being such a volume shooter yep. from the, the power forward spot. And then Brunson has been excellent at, at, at at point guard, obviously. So, but again, you need, um, the team doesn't have great shooting. They haven't had it. They didn't have it in Grimes is shooting really well. So it, it's, it's just something to monitor more than anything. And I think there's some things mechanically, um, where, you know, he's a high two motion shooter that, you know, these guys tend to struggle a little bit in terms of the distance on those shots. And obviously from the corner, it's a little bit uh, shorter of a shot where at the top of the key, it's a, you know, it's a little bit different. So maybe there's some fatigue happening, but he needs to shoot better. I mean, that's kind of like what it is. You can't just be a great shooter from, you know, a, a, th a third of the court. That's not good enough, especially where this team thinks they're going to go. And we know Josh Hart, you know, he's really, he can be solid in the corners as well, but you really need that variety and that d diversity. And, you know, I think part of it, if and this is kind of where I'll end in kind of kick it back to you, he can go long swaths of time without getting a shot. And I, I just wonder I when you're a two motion him. guy, you know, you don't, you tend to have to have that rhythm and everything kind of be in sync, a lot of moving parts with his, his shooting form. And when you can go 10 minutes without getting a single shot up, I could see how that can have a negative impact on you. So I just want to make sure that I am clear on something because sure. I don't, I don't think the game um, like, or I don't see the game like you do. As far as the ne necessity to have him be versatile enough to be in different areas of the, make shots uh, in, from different areas of the floor around the arc, is that just as simple as like, the, like the nature of NBA offense? Like, you're not always going to be able to park him in his preferred corner or his preferred side of the court. And if you, feel like you have to do that it's just going to be able to limit the sorts of actions that you could run is it is as basic as that 100 percent. and then i think there's you know where i look at a guy like just to give you an example joe harris is a very versatile shooter in terms of his where he can make shots and if you look at him in his transition numbers throughout his career have been amazing and it's not because he's dunking on people it's because he can sprint to whatever side of the court he's on sprint to the line usually at one of the wing spots and be a threat so you know, there's, it, I'm just going to bring it up because it was, it, it, you know, it got a lot of play, but his performance in that uh, rising stars game where he had that steal and he had the pull up oh, from, yeah. the, from the, from the right side. And it was kind of like, all right, that's a, a unique shot that Quentin Grimes is making from that spot because it's not something he's typically done over his, his career. So I was like, all right, maybe he does have that 
in him. But I think for for me, it's like, yeah, some of the actions you want to run, you you want to be able to have that versatility, but also great shooters are dynamic in transition. And I think that he's got that in him. He had it in college at Houston because I remember like during the draft process before the Knicks were kind of linked to him, he kind of jumped out in that way where he just had a lot of versatility, whether it was pull-ups, step backs, movement shots from either side, you know, going left, going right, and then the transition stuff. So he's kind of been a little more limited in terms of what he's been doing as a New York Nick. And I don't know if that's a coaching thing or some regression as him as a shooter, but um, it, it just it kind of limits you. And I feel the transition piece of it is important. The Knicks are, have never, they're just they're a poor transition team. So him having that threat as a shooter from either side as a, th- as a, as a threat pulling up in transition um, can really boost them. I think the Knicks are one of the worst transition uh, teams in terms of the efficiency. So any yeah. edge they can get in that area would certainly help. Yeah. I, hearing you talk about it, it's like, it, it, this should be so obvious. And I, I don't know why I, I haven't, I, I needed you to talk about it to, to make it this clear. If you are going to do what it's, we've all seemed to talk ourselves into over the last few weeks and continue to build this team around Jalen Brunson and Julius Randle. It's not enough that you have a guy who, you know, a guy that can shoot or even a guy mm-hmm. that can shoot. Well, you need that. Like I'm, I'm thinking back to like when, when there was a lot of t- uh, trade talk about Mikel, um, uh, Beasley, Malik, Beasley. Mm-hmm. Malik, Beasley. Malik, yes, Malik Beasley. <laughs> And like um, we we do a thing here every time I mention Zach Lowe, I I have to take a drink. So there you go. <laughs> On the low post, um, Low would uh, Zach would talk about how there aren't five guys in the league that could like come around a screen, you know, either direction, whatever, and just like don't need any time, really don't need any room, and fire away. And when you when you factor that skill in with mm-hmm. the volume and the percentage, even with the inconsistency. It's so valuable because no team will ever not know where in a similar way to you talk about Joe 100%. Harris. No team's ever going to forget where Joe. I mean, not if they're doing it, they're not a very good team. Mm. A good team is never going to forget where Joe Harris is or stop being attention to Joe Harris. Same thing with with Beasley. Grimes needs to become that if he is going to continue to, I think, be in this key role um, for this team moving forward. You mentioned you wondered about um, if him going large swaths of time without shooting the ball was like how much that factored. So I did a little digging today and I, and I think this is, this is probably going to be a ridiculous stat. Okay. Ridiculous. in the sense I'm, here for, I'm here for it. It's probably meaningless because I, I think it's a little bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy and you'll see what I mean by that. Mm. Um, so he's played in 102 NBA games so far in his career, which again, to back up what you just said a minute ago, it's not a lot, especially since a large a large number of those games were games where he was like maybe in his rookie year, mm-hmm. coming off the bench, playing a few minutes here, a few minutes there before he got in the rotation. Even early this season, remember that situational garbage? Yeah, yeah. That, was, that was. It feels like, was like, a, like, a, like a decade ago. My God, <laughs> it does, it's, it's like three seasons ago. Um, so with that caveat, Quentin Grimes is only um, taken it has taken seven or more three-point shots in 23 of his 102 games that he has played in his career. In the 23 games that he's taken, seven or more three-point shots, he is 90 for 202 from deep in those games for a conversion rate of 44.6%. Pretty good. In the other, I didn't do the other math, but so, uh, what seventy was seventy nine? Yeah, let's go. With, let's go with seventy nine. In the other seventy nine games in which he has taken six or fewer threes, he's eighty six for two seventy eight in those other games for a conversion rate of thirty one percent. Now, again, why is this a silly stat? It's a silly stat because if a guy is hitting shots early on, his teammates are going to try to give him the ball more. Even so, I, I did find the 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 difference here. A, a little staggering. And I also, mm. the other thing that I thought was interesting in game, and again, talk about small sample size theater. They're eight and five in games uh, in which he's taken eight or more threes, which it doesn't sound very impressive. Two of those are overtime losses. And one of those was a one point loss. And then one of the other ones was actually his first game that he ever uh, joined the rotation that bought the bucks game where they ended yeah. up getting mm-hmm. blown out. So like, I don't even know if I want to count that. 
they seem to do well when he takes a lot of shots. Yeah. <laughs> um, when they figure out a way, whether it's because he's going well. I, again, it's the chicken or the egg question. Yeah, I, I, I just well, want to throw that out there. I, yeah, well, yeah, thirteen uh, percent difference. You know, I don't know if fourteen percent almost. Yeah. Fourteen, right? Almost fourteen. So I don't know if you, if the idea of him getting more shots because he's making them is an account for that. I, I tend to agree with you that that's part of it for sure. Not all of it, and. You know, it's it's one of those things where I'm thinking, where is the room to increase his volume? And that's kind of where it can get a little hairy because, you know, depending on who he's playing with, you know, you got to get RJ's touches, obviously Brunson you're, and you're and setting Randall. up my transition to the next player yeah. I want to talk about. Can, can you take a wild guess who the next player I want to talk about is? Well, you you tell me because I don't want to I, I don't want to steal the thunder. So you go. It's you, R- tra- you mentioned him. It's RJ. All right. Well, listen. Uh, I, I know you noise. get a lot That's of flack. the RJ Barrett noise. I, I know you get a lot of flack made. for this. And let me just say that I tend to be in lockstep with you in terms of how you view him. And I felt like, and I know I'm just going on this. Um, so you, there wasn't really a question there. Um, no, but that, this is what we do. This is what the podcast is. The Hornets game was sort of a, just, it was RJ in a nutshell. And yep. it, everything in that first half was the good RJ where he was able to get downhill when he wanted to, and they were at a deep drop. He was able to sort of, you know, he, he played with a, with a young center, a rookie center, figure out a way to whether or not he's going to defend the drive or sort of back off and defend the, that, that dump off. So he's, RJ was doing a great job of just deciding whether or not to finish or dump that ball off to Mitch. He had a couple of assists um, in that way. And then when he would get, I think he got Uber on his hip at least twice. There was at least one where he sort of like got him in hostage patiently dribbled up and then hit that little push shot in rhythm going towards the basket, which is key because I've been critical of him with that sort of non-restricted area shooting where he can get in trouble, where he gets stagnant, two feet planted, no momentum. But then he's trying to do that, that push shot, which he did in the second half. He got, there was the one, there was the, the foul call that got overturned against Hayward, which I thought was a, obviously a questionable overturn because it looked like he got him the ball and then on down the wrist on the way down. I, I but to me, it was the shot attempt. That was the bigger issue. Little Nowhere little. to go. He's stagnant. Um, yes. The Knicks really didn't. I look back at that play. There wasn't any movement around him, but to me, that's a reset and just see what you can get beyond that. Um, too many times he's, and, and this is like, um, this is RJ going back to at least the Duke years of the year where he was sort of get into this zone where He's wanting to get to the rim, can't get all the way there. And then he's left to decide whether or not he's going to take a shot for the sake of shooting or try to figure out something else. And I think in the first half, we saw everything that, that kind of makes him um, a, a guy that you could see being the second or third best player on a really good team. And then the second half where they they needed that extra juice because quickly and Randall just didn't have it and no Brunson. And it was some adjustments by the Hornets, trapping him a few times, taking the ball out of his hands, and he didn't really respond well. So, I mean, it was like, like I said, it was sort of like that that night and day performance, which is like, you know, a guy that's 22, he's going to have these things. But again, this is sort of like the grime stuff where the expectations are the expectations now. And this team has real goals here to win at least a round in the playoffs. So we need to... to it, we need to hold these guys accountable for performances that aren't where they needed to be. And uh, to me, that second half really wasn't um, acceptable. Although I will say his defense, at least the last couple of games has been markedly better, which to me is are, uh, almost as important as, as anything, because they just need him to be competent on that area. But I don't, did I, you see that similar thing in that, in that uh, game first half to second half? You, you described it much better than I could have you, the, the Hayward shot. I went back and watched his um, all of his second half. I I I, I know I, people are going to hear that. Like, Why did you watch his first half possessions? Those are the good ones. It's because I know they're good. I don't need to right. go back. And <laughs> they were great. But I went back and rewatched all of his second half uh, shooting possessions. And there was another one where he took a shot from the same about the same spot as the 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 with the Hayward overturn. And I think it was. It wasn't blocked, but it, there was a good contest there by mm-hmm. either Washington or Ubre, and it was like you said he had stopped, and the defense had kind of converged already, and 
nine times out of 10, when that sorts of thing happens, it, it doesn't maybe the 10th time he doesn't have the angle, but usually there's an angle to a pass and it's an obvious pass. And sure enough there, who was right behind him was Obi Toppin and just nobody within see it. 10 feet from mm-hmm. And But you say didn't see it. <laughs> I'm trying to be kind. <laughs> <laughs> I, but what is more? I'm, I'm I, like, this is what, you know, like, right. It's more kind. That's tough. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Uh, you're right. It's a, that, that's a tough one because he may have, he may have seen him and was yeah. like, I'm just, I'm RJ Barrett and I'm just going to get this, this I'm going to shot up. So, uh, just on that thought, because yeah. that, the way you just put it, I'm RJ Barrett, I'm getting this shot up. The, we've, we keep talking about, or I keep talking about it. Every, almost everybody on this team, there very rarely, if ever, do you see a possession where a shot is taken where you're like, eh, I don't know about that shot. I don't know about that guy taking that shot it, with that much time left on the clock or from that spot or without, you know, there wasn't enough movement to this and that. The only, I don't want to say the only exception because there are, look, there are times Julius still has his moments where he mm-hmm. takes shots, although with the shots he's made this year, I don't know how if we could really say that anymore. But like it happens, but it happens more with RJ, I think than than everybody else, which is why to me, over the next fifteen games, and then God willing, going into the playoffs, I don't even think it's close. I think he's the key to what they're capable of and, and how far that they could go. Because if he could just wipe out those stretches where it's like, and I, I I think like you, I think he's thinking, well, if Jalen Brunson can do it and Julius Randle could do it, mm-hmm. well, I could do it, and like. I, there's a part of me that appreciates that, but for this team this year, I, I, I that I don't think that could be the mentality. I it just can't. Don't. It doesn't. It doesn't fly. And no. here I'll, I'll give. Um, and I'm going to butcher his name. And we've talked about last names already. But our colleague Chris Percy Percy Einan. There you Percy go. Percy Einan. I don't know if <laughs> I, that's a, literally the first time that last name has come out of my mouth. So, Chris, well, I apologize. Chris P. It's fine. Chris P. Asked a brilliant question post game to RJ talking about the fact that first half you were incredibly efficient. Second half, uh, whether well, it was one of 11, one of 10, whatever it was, like what well, was, he was one of nine in the, f- he was actually okay in the third. He was, he was three of five in the third. He was one okay. of nine in the fourth. One of nine yeah. in the fourth. Okay. So like basically what happened when the shots weren't falling and I thought this was pretty enlightening where, you know, RJ mentioned the fact that they were trapping, which they were in the second half. And then he said, listen, I got, good shots in the second half in that fourth quarter and they just didn't go in. And to me, I'm like, all right, well, if we're talking about process and I know that's a, a, you know an important thing, even if those shots went in, the process wasn't good and the process was obviously bad and the shots didn't go in and he just didn't, at least, you know, maybe he goes back and looks at the film and things. He, he changes his perspective. You know, he's 20 minutes or a half hour after the game ended. So I get it, but he didn't seem like he was, perturbed by some of those looks he was getting in that set in that fourth quarter. And to me, that is a little alarming, to be honest, a little bit. I, I thank you for bringing that up. I actually did not even hear that quote. I, I hope he was thinking about the threes. I mean, the, the threes were good looks um, mm-hmm. running into a very large human by the name of PJ Washington and then getting your ball swatted so hard in the other direction and then I, he thought he was fouled but like but that's another thing he I that's something that I, I wish you know there's a way to initiate contact and I think there is still a little bit of a skill thing there for as much as I don't think he gets a good whistle he does not get a good whistle let's just say right. that he doesn't get a good whistle and that's I guess hopefully that improves but whatever um yeah we, we'll hope we'll hope for for better from him um I'll I'll throw it back to you. Give me one more. Give me one more guy you want to touch on, talk about uh, that's interesting to you. One more thing that they do or or not doing. You you mentioned low hanging fruit before. Like anything you want to anywhere you want to take well, it. Well, the guy that seems to be he's the one missing piece to this puzzle to me is Obi Toppin, and I feel okay. like there's just isn't uh, he. There's been obviously the three point shooting is really tapered off as the season has, has moved on. And there was that, uh, he had just entered the game last night and McBride gets a steal. Mm-hmm. It's a, basically a two on one where Obi is running on the left side. And instead of just running hard to the rim, he sort of flares out to the corner, ends up getting the pass. Doesn't end up shooting it right away from that left corner. No. Pump fakes, then gets a shot up. And it was one of those things where I feel like 
he, there is just something that has changed with him. And I went back and I watched that opening night game last year against the Celtics where he enters the game and he is this transition dynamo where you just couldn't. And there was a point last year where it just seemed like every play was him sprinting down the court and getting a quality look at the basket and finishing with authority and with dexterity with both hands. And that is just not there. And Josh Hart's impact has been positive in that way. In that way, he has hit Obi a few times mm-hmm. in transition, which I'm hoping can kind of ca- um, move him along and just give him a little bit more boost. But he's the one player to me where you know you're going to need his. I know it doesn't seem like a lot, but his 12 to 15 minutes oh, matter in a the, playoff series in against a, right. the fucking I name a playoff team that they might face. Yeah. I mean, it, it matters. It matters. And he played well in the first go round against the Hawks. I thought he had a lot of good moments in that first round series two years ago. He he is a difference maker when he can get out in transition and he just has a different feel to him than any player on this roster. And it just feels like that aspect of his game has atrophied. And I don't and I'm not even I don't I know it's not because of him. I know it's because of just the way he's been used. It's because of the the lack of minutes. It's because of sort of the way they've wanted him to play, where he's more of a stretch four hybrid swing wingman, something or the other, where his elite skill is just not there anymore. And that's getting to the rim and finishing um, as well as any big in the league. And that's the sort of talent he has that has n- not been there. And the shooting has really come down. So you're left with this guy that, has been much better defensively. So I'm not going to say he's a negative on that end, but he's certainly not a dominant defensive player. So his value to this team is going to be his ability to get down court, finish and transition and sort of inject some juice into this uh, team. Um, and I know that Josh Hart has that ability and he's certainly done a lot of those things that we thought he could do going, grab and go coast to coast, finishing with either hand. He's been great at that, but Obi is another one that can do it. And they just need him to sort of, find his way. And I'm not saying it's easy because again, we're it's, he, he, he doesn't play a lot. That's just the fact of the matter. And he's, he's sort of, I can't imagine mentally what he's going through in terms of like looking over the shoulder and figuring and wondering whether or not he's going to play eight minutes or 10 minutes or 12 minutes or whatever. But again, we're talking about, I think accountability is a big theme here because <clears throat> this team is, <clears throat> has real goals this year. And for them to meet their goals, everyone has to be pulling their weight. And for him, it's making shots when he has them and obviously uh, being a dynamite transition player, uh, first and foremost. So that's the thing that I'm just really hoping turns because it's important for this roster. To I completely agree. Um, he, something has happened to him. And mm. it is... Like I'm, t- I have a tendency to be. Let's look at the player first before we start blaming. And again, mm-hmm. as as I'm sure you, as everybody listening to this knows, it's my natural inclination to be like, before we go and blame somebody else, let's let's look at the player first. Mm-hmm. But it's clear as day that they've they want him to be a three point. They want him to be essentially a, a three and D guy, right? Is mm-hmm. as the backup four. Um, so it's that's been encouraged, and like. More to the point, I guess, than that, he he was this dynamic player last year, especially. And I think he finished on that great run. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just looked it up now. He had in um, 1,230 minutes, so a little bit more than 1,200 minutes last year. He had 102 dunks. And I just did the maths. One dunk every 12 minutes. So, mm-hmm. okay. Yep. This year... 33 dunks in 758 minutes. That's one dunk every 23 minutes. So he is dunking the ball about half as much as he was last year. And like, I, it's, 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 it's not inexplicable because well, you just explained it very well, but it is, yeah, it is unacceptable. Well, that's, a, that's alarming. So thank you for, kind of putting a light on, on those with those numbers, because that's pretty stark. And a lot of it is the fact that, you know, there's that play where he's typically in the left corner when teams kind of don't respect him or don't, or or you have a tagger coming over. So he's left kind of unoccupied in the corner. He will very 
commonly cut to the basket and you would get a lot of dunks, a lot of alley-oops out of that action. And it's been almost a meme this year of him cutting, having a lane, pointing up to the sky, trying desperately calling for the alley-oop and it doesn't come. And then we've seen as the season has kind of progressed, the frustration and, um, and I can't even blame him sort of like, no, you can't pour out of him. And it's just one of those things where there's so many factors here that are at play. Um, but certainly his, his teammates could do a better job of finding him. And, um, just last thing on him the, and the one, I guess, positive is that this 61 minutes. So this, the top in Hartenstein, uh, Josh Hart, Barrett quickly lineup. Okay. 61 minutes plus 14 and a half, uh, 116 offensive oh, rating, 101.5 defensive rating. So he's part of a unit that's, again, small sample size, 61 minutes, but has played well. So uh, even if you know he's not sort of doing the things that maybe we both think he can do, at the bare minimum, he's part of a unit that has been pretty impressive. So it, I think there's a lot of... I like that lineup. I think it's a, there's some good versatility, a lot of things they could do. Um, and we'll see if that can continue, but I'm just hoping that he can sort of get to another gear. Um, I think it's just important for this, uh, this team. Yeah. It's, it's wild that like, I think if you would ask most Knicks fans coming or off of last year, mm -hmm. actually, no, if you would ask every Knicks fan coming off of last year, name me your three, the, the three things about this team right now that you're most excited about, that you're most looking forward to in 2022-23, um, I think like 90% of Nick fans, the, the three names would have been quickly RJ and OB. Mm -hmm. And for as great as this year has been, two of those three players are the like the two kind of ones that are, you know, to some degree of concerning. And, and as you just put it very well, they it needs to be good. You know, um, it needs to be good for them to succeed in the playoffs because for as much as, again, Bronson and Randall and, and Hart and quickly and Mitch are doing their thing. And like, again, are those five probably going to be the five on the floor at the end of a close playoff game? Yes. Um, but um, yeah. OK, let's let's finish up on a positive note. Let's do um, it. <laughs> <laughs> give me um give me something that you it, it doesn't have to be that technical. Just give me something you've really enjoyed about this year, this team, a player, a, a, anything. Yeah. Well, I think Mitch is the guy for me. Um, oh yeah. And I will You're only say guy? this. Yeah. I'm a Mitch guy. And it was from the, I mean, it was like that first summer league game. I just remember watching oh, him and just being, all right, all right, who is this skinny kid they got in the second round that is <laughs> blocking three pointers in a way that I've yeah. literally never seen before. And yeah. I've just been, you know, he's been more intrigued than anything kind of early on in his career. And it's like I've said this before. Tom Thibodeau's impact on a lot of players has been positive, um, none more than him. I think he is the the marriage between player and coach on this uh, Nick, and obviously Julius Randle has to be the poster trial because you know Tom is basically he empowered Julius to be this player that no literally no other coach thought he could be uh, up until the point that uh, Tom Thibodeau took over as Nick's head coach. So putting Julius aside because the job that um, uh, Tibbs has done with him has been obviously well documented, but he has Mitchell Robinson, a kid that uh, obviously had a you know a unique uh, pathway to the NBA, and he's turned him into a whether or not you call him a top ten or top eight center, just one of the more when he's healthy. And this that's the the one little uh, the caveat here: when he's healthy, there is just very few centers in the league that can combine the skills that he has. And that's the offensive mm -hmm. rebounding. That's the ability to uh, dominate in the paint in ways that, you know, is so unique. I mean, there's great screen setters in the league. There's guys that can stretch the floor. There's guys that can obviously defend the rim, but there's just very few that can defend the rim and dominate on the offensive glass in a way that he can. And to me, he is, he's at the perfect body type. Now he's him in skinny, yeah. Like, put on all the weight after the foot injury looked slow at times last year. This year looks perfect. I mean, he just seems like he has finally figured out in his mid twenties, sort of that perfect weight where he still has that high level athleticism, even though it's not what he was his first couple of seasons, but it's good enough. And he is arguably one of the top five or six strongest centers in the league. And I think that just gets lost because you can't be a dominant offensive rebounder without that strength in the lower body. And he's, you just see the way he's filled out in the shoulder area. Mm -hmm. So credit to him for 
putting in that work to to change his body and just see he's a just a solid guy now. I just I, I'm I'm not left with like how's Mitch going to handle Jakob Hurdle again? How's Mitch going to handle this center? <laughs> I just know he's going to be, he's, he's not, I know he's not going to get three fouls in the first in 20 minutes of action. He's going to be solid. And that is just so huge for this roster and why that he is such an important piece to them because just so much of what they do revolves around how he protects the paint in their drop coverage and how he can generate second chances on the offensive glass. So he's the guy that just had a blast watching for sure. I'm going to amend what I said a minute ago or a few minutes ago. If they face Cleveland in the first round, which mm-hmm. I I hope they will, I think they will. Mm-hmm. Um, if he is the best, let me make sure I, I believe this before I say it. Yeah, if he's the best big man in the series, and I was talking specifically about him, uh, Mobley and, and Allen. Mm-hmm. If he is somehow the best of those three, they're going to win this. I, they're not losing the series. I, I just don't see how that would be possible. They're not. I and agree with you. They're not. <laughs> and if that and if that sets up, if that if we I'm talking about getting ahead of myself, coming off a loss to the freaking Hornets, but if that <laughs> if they won that series and that sets up a matchup with the Bucks. You want to talk about a test for for Mitch? I'm not saying it's one he can't pass, but like Boyd is facing that team presents yeah. some some interesting that's, challenges. That's the issue, right? Because yeah. Mitch against a a shooter that like Brooke in their drop scheme, which they'll concede um, as, as Benji's been Benji's been talking about this all season long. They'll they'll concede that yeah, they will, you know. But you then know, you're but, gonna they're gonna have a lot of Mitch on Gian- and again. We're Giannis are getting too, way ahead of ourselves, but um, Mitch on Giannis. I mean, didn't work out great that that last matchup he, he Mitch had did have a couple of fouls pretty early but uh I am just I've been so impressed with him and that contract descending oh, right I think it's a descending yeah, contract I mean it just said it's it's gonna be a really good one uh, if he can stay healthy it's he's gonna um it's just it's gonna be a great value uh deal and I'm just been uh I I I think the progress he's got a little more room to grow I think offensively he had that uh, finish the other night um, oh out in the perimeter against Boston where he had that high rip through, lefty dribble, put the ball on the floor wow. three or four times. It's in there. Maybe there's something else there in the bag it's that he there. can sort of pull out. But yeah, Mitch, I love Mitch, man. Big fan. It's, why, it's just it's so crazy. He he was, as you alluded to very kindly and gently, <clears throat> arguably the wild card of that draft for yeah. a lot of reasons. He had mm-hmm. had, a, yeah, as you said, a, tr- a, a non-traditional path, whatever your word was. Um Going that dude going to what was at the time, I, I mean, I'll just say it as big a dumpster fire in terms of like an organization that you trusted to develop and like bring along that sort of person, that sort of talent. You would have bet, I, I mean, I would have bet anything like, yeah, I, I, how many teams is this guy going to be on by the time he's like, or what team is it going to be where he finally figures it out? It's going to be his third team, his fourth team, mm-hmm. fifteen. And for him to now be set up potentially. To again, he's got a couple more years to go before he passes Mello, but to potentially be the longest tenured Nick and, uh, and an impactful one at that mm-hmm. um, since the '90s uh, is is it's just it's a crazy story, and that's why I, really, I hope he stays um, and I hope he's here for for more years. But yeah, anyway, and he's okay. a gem gem of a person, obviously. I oh mean, my god, absolute gem! Love him. I mean, that alone is just <laughs> worth keeping him around. Yeah. Fred Katz is going to write a book completely based on Mr. Robinson quotes. It's coming. Well, he's got um, that story coming out, right? I can't wait for that yes, one. The, the, the Pulitzer. I'm sworn to secrecy, but I know <laughs> it's not a story. It's more of like a, a long anecdote. anecdote, and I'll yeah. just leave it at that. Okay. okay. Um, before I sign you off, I'm going to tell everybody listening, yes. if you are on Twitter and you do not follow DJ, who you've just heard uh, talk for the last better part of 45 minutes. Um, go on to Twitter right now and follow him. So how you somehow don't have 2,000 followers is beyond me. You should have uh, 20,000 or you should have 200,000 because your work is so good. Um, his you. Twitter is at Ace, A-C-E underscore Zulo, Z-U-L-L-O. Um, you won't be disappointed. Like, again, it, it's not just it's not just Nick stuff, but it, you're also not going to be inundated with like a ton of like, uh, you know, other NBA stuff. But the uh, But to me, the best part of following someone like you is you're going to get your your Nick stuff that you want, and the NBA stuff that you put out is going to make you a better. It's going to make you a better basketball fan. It's going to make you a better Knicks fan because you're going to be just more informed about the game. And like I love how you pick and choose the stuff that you analyze, your breakdowns, the you're whole too thing. Kind. Thank you. No man, seriously, I was I like when it. when I I'll, I'll just say it live. Um, when Andrew 
told me he's like, so I, I've been talking to, um, to DJ Zulo from Twitter. I was like, seriously? I, cause I didn't even think that it was like a thing, you know, in the, in the cards. And then, uh, I got really irrationally, ex- not irrationally excited. I got like rationally excited. Well, thank you. I, I mean, I go really, I go f- way back to the beginning of, uh, Nick's film school. Um, We've talked about that, you know, kind of the yeah. origin story about where it came from. So I've been, and this, I'm not just saying this, I've been a, a huge admirer of the work that um, you, Andrew, and the, and the team have done uh, for all these years now. So just to be a part of that is um, just been an amazing, amazing experience, experience oh, for me. So thank you so much. No, obviously. please. It's been uh, great. It's been it's, great. Uh, we're at the be- we're at the beginning. Lots and we have, have a winning team to do it to analyze. I mean, how, how awesome is this? <laughs> Hopefully for years to come. Yes. Uh, also, I'm forgetting this part because again, I, I only think on Twitter. Subscribe to DJ's YouTube channel, which is at Craft NBA. I am not going to ask out loud or I say out loud that I was today years old when I learned that YouTube channels have an at in front of them. It's a, I that think it's a new thing. Like idiot. Yeah, well, listen, um, it's a, I think a new phenomenon, but I'm just, okay. I'm jumping aboard. You know, we got the, got the shorter, uh, they, they kind of give you a way to have your own unique URL. So, oh, that's cool. Go. Yeah. Okay. No, listen, I learn something new every day. Okay. We're, we're late for a, 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 a <laughs> oh, Andrew's making me feel better that it only started <laughs> last year. Uh, we're late for a Patreon town hall. Um, DJ, anything else before I let you go? Oh, man. Thank you. Enjoy it. Uh, Okay, uh, everybody out there, thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Knicks Film School podcast. We will be back with, uh, what do we got? Pre-game uh, tomorrow before the uh, Kings game. We got a post-game with me that I trust will last until the sun comes up after the Knicks have uh, a great bounce back win. And then uh, all kinds of fun stuff. Uh, oh, and uh, our live uh, watch party. Uh, don't forget to come to Penn 6, 31st Street, 7th Avenue, um on saturday to watch the clippers game i think that's it uh okay see you everybody peace